Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Filippo Taddei. I'm an associate professor of the practice in international economics, and I am joined tonight by my colleague, uh, Professor Eric Jones, uh, Professor of European Studies and International Political Economy and Director of European and Eurasian Studies. Our um, presentation will be split into part. Uh, I will take the first uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then I will be followed by Eric's presentation. And at, at, the, end of this, uh, at the end of our uh, joint presentation, you'll be able to ask us any questions. So without any further ado, let me get into the um, first uh, re resumed uh, initiative by the Bologna Institute for Policy Research, our policy talk. And obviously, we couldn't do it without focusing on the uh, current coronavirus crisis. So let me share the screen so that we can start with our discussion here. All right. So we are, uh, Eric and myself uh, asked uh, a very simple question, uh, not only how we can think about uh, the response to the current crisis, but also how we can deal with the consequences of it. Okay. We are uh, certain about one thing, we are uncertain about another one, or maybe, you know, uh, as uh, time moves, uh, the, uh, salute, the uncertainty regarding the solution is becoming uh, less and less so. So, why is the response to this uh, uh, crisis controversial? Well, first of all, what kind of crisis are we talking about here? We're talking about, differently from any uh, other major crisis that we experienced in the last uh, a uh, few years. Uh, the origin is not the financial system. The, or the origin is not demand. This is not a demand shock. It's a supply shock. So it's the kind of shock that we haven't seen in a long time. You know, at least since uh, the, the latest uh, example of those have been the oil price shocks. So this is something that we thought was uh, forgotten. But well, if not, and by supply shock we mean uh, we mean it in the most brutal and uh, simple way. So this is a, a stop to production that triggered extreme liquidity need. So basically, we have an important chunk of production in a, a lot of countries around the world, especially among advanced and emerging countries that cannot produce anymore as much as they, as they did. And as the businesses stopped, the, the, the um, requirement for liquidity became suddenly and very extreme, okay? So because of that, there's a conventional reason why we are in disagreement or why at least people are uh, discussing about what is the proper response. The one is about uh, credit. You know, we are really talking about uh, the provision of credit here, how to smooth this uh, crisis, to keep uh, businesses afloat, to make people more secure about their future, less uncertain. And, you know, in the eternal world of Paul Getty, in this case, we are looking at a shock that is tremendously large. We're also looking at an amount of debt and an amount of credit that is very large. So this is the conventional reason why there is a controversy here regarding your response. Then there is also a, a bit of an unconventional reason. Okay? Uh, this is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a um, crisis that took us completely um, uh, uh, by surprise. We, were, we did not expect something this severe. And actually, this is the most uh, severe crisis since uh, World War II, since uh, the Great Recession. For sure, you know, we can say goodbye to the Great Recession as the most important uh, uh, shock uh, after World War II. This is certainly will overcome that uh, uh, sorry record. And uh, because, of, because of the time be before, uh, because of how prompt uh, this uh, crisis was, we are unprepared. We are unprepared for a timely response and also a problem. So, in addition to the conventional reason and, con and also the unconventional reason why we are discussing this issue, there is also some European twist. And the European twist uh, comes from some of the structural problems that we've had in Europe for an extended period of time. We don't have a clear schema for fiscal policy coordination. Obviously, we have monetary policy coordination because we have one central bank, but we are in a context where uh, we, um, uh, there isn't that much of policy co coordination on the fiscal front. This is a, always a problem, but it's especially a problem right now. And uh, as a consequence of that, we've seen that monetary policy has uh, overextended. It has overextended in the past years and is obviously uh, extending now. This is not just by uh, any mean a problem only in uh, Europe. It's also something that we experience in the U.S. as well. So the question is, uh, what should we expect now? Well, you know, we have, uh, if we look at Europe, uh, 
we, if you go all the way from the Maastricht Treaty, all the way down to, to the fiscal compact, uh, two-pack, six-pack, it doesn't matter. It's obvious, but it's a framework built for stability. It's not um, uh, meant to deal with crisis response. In fact, if uh, there's anything we learned after the Great Recession, that has been uh, that we've put in place some sort of a crisis response, but it's a crisis response facility, the European Stability Mechanism, which is built on conditionality and is, and is indeed thought to deal with asymmetric shocks. So not on, on something that hits all countries together, but it's one country alone. So in a sense, you know, the, the promise, the promise of the euro for, for many countries was we built a, a stable area. In this stable area, you know, things will be easy to do, will be smooth. Uh, borrowing will be cheap, interest rate will go down, and interest rate in the, in the real sense, so real interest rate will go down. And, you know, of course, countries might differ there, crisis might come, but by and large, this will be the main promise of the euro. Okay? So if you want, this is the measure of uh, uh, the European project. Okay? It's about uh, uh, being stable and uh, guaranteeing people that they can plan ahead because they, they face low rates and they face a stable environment. Both these things, at least, well, low rates are, are still there, but all the rest is, is gone. So financial flows, not surprisingly, have responded before the policy has, has been enacted or while the policy, the policy response was, be, was enacted. Okay? It, they have responded in a in, uh, standard way. You know, we've observed the standard flight to quality from the south to the north of the eurozone. This is something that we've already experienced during the Great Recession and became even more uh, transparent now. But... We also have a new flight to quality. Uh, one from, you know, we, as the crisis expand into emerging market, we also see that uh, there is a capital flight or flight to quality out of emerging market and toward Europe and the United States alike. A measure of this financial imbalance, at least if we want to focus on the eurozone, is the uh, notorious, okay, or ma many times discussed, uh, target two uh, system. A target two is nothing else than a payment system. It's something that tracks. Uh, credit payments that are made between private and public institutions within the Eurozone. So it's really a brutal measure of uh, what you could call uh, a kind of a balance of payments crisis. And here you see something, okay, that as this uh, crisis accelerated, as the coronavirus started taking a uh, uh, higher toll and stopping more and more production, we've seen a little bit of the same uh, kind of tendency that uh, appeared before. So we've seen more uh, more funds flowing toward a safer country. Here we consider Germany and on the other side, Italy as a, the two uh, points in the example. Okay, so money flowing, it's a kind of a, of a measure of flight to quality. But really, if we want to be more precise, you know, we really have to focus uh, on financial imbalances. Really, it's always worthwhile to focus on the main player in financial flows, and that is the bond market. Okay, uh, you know, I used to think uh, that if there was a reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president of the Pope, but I would like to come back as the bond market, as James Carville mentioned, because the, the bond market is really a measure of uh, trust, is a measure, and it's huge. It's a, so it's a very strong bit. In fact, not surprisingly, we can track, look at the bond market. Here we're looking at the government spread. So uh, the difference between how much, uh, what is the bond yield on 10-year debt between uh, four countries that, have, uh, that are more uh, fragile, that have been more fragile in this crisis and in general, in comparison with the yield that we observe in Germany. And if we look at these four, we see basically how the bond market price responded to pretty much any implementation of, of action. First of the miscommunication by at the end of the press conference uh, uh, by uh, of uh, the executive board of the European uh, uh, Central Bank, where President Lagarde made this statement regarding the fact that the ECB is not there to close the spread, so to take care of, in a sense, of the price of government bonds. Uh, you, as you see, that was not very well received from the market. All spread started jumping up. The ECB had then later to intervene, almost a week later had to intervene with uh, the pandemic program, the PEP, putting down additional money. And, you, and of course, you know, the bond market, as mighty as it is, started to respond and yield started dropping. And then and they did it dropped even further when it was also, also, also the capital key. So in a sense, the fixed limit on how much of uh, government debt can be bought was also relaxed. So... The bond market is a measure of all of these things. 
but it's a measure of something that is coming ahead, that, you know, what we will, uh, we will have to manage later on. And what do we have to manage? Well, we have to manage with a lot of that. So it's worth reminding ourselves where we were before the crisis, where we are likely to be, so that we can think about what is, what can we do, okay? I mean, with overextended monetary policy, what else can we do? So where we were is this. This is the level of debt for advanced economies, uh, pretty much in, in 2011, okay? So it grew even further. And you see here that advanced economies had, at the end of the, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, the same level of uh, debt than we, uh, that we observed at the end of World War II. In addition to that, what happened? Or actually, as a consequence of that, major central banks around the globe expanding their balance sheet, started buying, buying security, expanding their balance sheet. Here we see the growth of the uh, Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet and also the partial correction of that balance sheet that took place uh, from 2018 onward. By the way, if you think that the, this is something that uh, only involves the Fed, well, you're wrong because the ECB followed the lead and kept on expanding uh, its uh, balance sheet as well. The purple area is a measure of how much government debt has been purchased by the ECB throughout the response to the crisis. So here you've got a sense of the, of the fact that as that was accumulated, a, a larger and larger share of that debt was also being uh, uh, purchased by central bank. This is where we were. It's, point, it, it's worthwhile spending a minute to think about where we will be. You know, and to do so, just uh, uh, it can be useful to think about uh, the fundamental basic arithmetic of debt to GDP. So what you have here on the left-hand side of this equation is a change in debt over GDP. You know, so how much you're likely to. And you see that it's affected by basically four factors. How much you pay on your debt, the interest rate, how, how fast you're growing, uh, G, uh, what is the amount of debt that you had to begin with? So you, the lump of debt that you inherited from the past. And finally, what is the amount of uh, uh, fiscal deficit that you're running? Okay. So just for the sake of the argument, why don't we take a look at uh, um, uh, the likely evolution of debt over GDP from where it is now to uh, where it will be after this crisis, given the severity of the crisis and the likely response that we will be observing. Let's take for the sake of the example, Italy. Italy has 136% uh, uh, of GDP, uh, debt over GDP ratio. And uh, well, you know, how, how do things stand in the four variables that we talked about? You know, if we want to be generous, we can think that the, the cost of debt is 2%. Uh, if things uh, uh, go where they are now, we will be have a drop in nominal GDP around 5%. Thank God we don't need to refinance all that, all 136% of GDP all together in one year, but only 25%. And of course, with, uh, revenue are down, spending is up, so we'll be running a very large uh, deficit. I mean, it's not specific to Italy, but we, for the sake of the example, this is where we are. If you put all these four numbers together and you ask yourself what will, what will be the change in debt to the GDP, for Italy alone, we are looking at a number very likely to be north of 150%. The same exercise you can conduct on any other country in the Eurozone for the US, for countries around the world. So the bottom line is we will have a lot of that. Okay. Obviously, you could respond, well, we have a lot of that. So why don't we should we should we uh, expect just uh, that the central bank will keep on doing what uh, they will do, what they already done. So they will keep on buying uh, government debt. You know, sure, that can happen. But we have to be aware that uh, there are some limits to it or there are some uh, trouble to it because uh, uh, central bank have a mandate and actually they have a very different mandate. And the mandate of the ECB is uh, somewhat uh, strikingly different uh, from the one of finance because it's very much focused on price stability. It doesn't mean that the ECB cannot do anything else, but price stability comes first and it clearly gets to the, the center stage. If you compare it with what, for instance, the Federal Reserve does, and you compare the mandate to that, you see that the, the, the mandate of the Federal Reserve is much broader. It talks about uh, goals of maximum employment, stable prices, moderate long-term interest rate, but the goals are all together at, uh, at the same level, at the same level of priority. That's not the case for the ECB. And in, in any case, just in case you wonder, there is also another 
general treaty that uh, work that uh, determine the functioning of the European Union, which is the no bailout. It's a very important article, you know, very often cited, Article 123, that says, look, in any case, the ECB or any national central bank cannot, uh, cannot uh, finance member states, uh, public, private institutions, anything. You know, their job is not to uh, help, to provide their direct instrument to help the solvency of any institution private or public within the uh, Eurozone. So the uh, ECB response, you know, if you go and see the language, you know, is always uh, based on guaranteeing the well-functioning monetary policy, right? So, and this is, this is not just a matter of language, it's also a matter of uh, priority, right? You know, in fact, if you go back to what, uh, to the last statement that Mario Draghi uh, made after the, his last press conference, they, uh, uh, or, and you compare it it's also with the statement that was done by President Lagarde in uh, the latest uh, uh, press conference, but it's always this idea that it's about, you know, facilitating the function of monetary policy, favor, uh, providing favorable funding conditions for the real economy. Everything is always about stability, making sure that you can use a monetary policy, that uh, this uh, credit market works so that you can keep stable prices stable. So in a sense, the, this, this, this language confirms that the target of the ECB is liquidity, not solvency. What's the problem now? Well, the problem is that in a crisis like this, we've already said at the beginning, during a supply crisis where you stop production, a liquidity shock is a solvency shock. It's very hard to tell the two apart in general, and especially at a time like this. So, final, final uh, bottom line before giving the floor to uh, Eric. How do we survive all of this? Well, we survive it in uh, two ways. Uh, first of all, we have to think about how we get out of this lump of debt. Well, we have way more debt than we've ever seen in advanced economies. You know, typically we think that high debt is a problem in emerging economies. Now it's, we're in advanced economies. And by way more, we mean even uh, more than we had at the end of World War II. I think the, the analogy with with uh, uh, wartime should stop there, but that's it. Obviously, we're in the middle of it, you know. So the uh, duration of this uh, crisis depends on the duration of the lockdown, and also an important factor, asynchrony here. This is a common shock, but it's not hitting every country at the same time. So some, some country will get out of the lockdown before others. This will create a, a, a synchrony in the business cycle in the time of recovery. It's an additional factor that we want to take into account. So. You could say, can we do more with monetary policy? Well, you know, we, we've done anything we could with monetary policy. We've expanded our QE. We've uh, produced an additional QE program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEP, you know, the one that you remember pushed down the uh, spread. And we've also provided pretty much any kind of funding or liquidity assistance to uh, private banks. So you could argue that on the monetary front, things are pretty much settled. Or there is a fiscal, so the solution has to be fiscal once we get out of this. But if it's fiscal, can it be at the national level? Well, you know, of course, if, we get, if it happens at the national level, there are two options. You pay back, which means that, you know, either you cut spending or you raise taxes in order to fill your debt, or you go radical. You could, do, you could realize that actually this amount of debt is really is too much. And so we will need to restructure the amount of debt that we have. Even a country like Italy, we're cruising north of 150% of debt over GDP, might have a real problem in sustaining that debt. Well, there's an advantage in this solution. You know, you don't need a lot of coordination. Every country does, goes on its own. But there's a clear disadvantage. And the disadvantage is that because we are so integrated together, especially so integrated within the Eurozone, whatever one country does unilaterally affects others. You know, Bloomberg published a a uh, couple of days ago, this sense of how, what is the amount of exposure that other countries within the Eurozone and also out of the Eurozone have toward Italy. This gives you a sense about uh, you know, the fact that even a unilateral move toward debt restructuring would be very problematic, would not be isolated to the country that does that. So is monetary policy over that well, you know, this doesn't seem the case. Is fiscal solution at national level uh, a solution? That's unlikely. Well, then we are left with uh, the unintended consequence of this fiscal policy coordination stack still. We have here possibly a double moral hazard, you know. One is the common moral hazard that everyone talks about. 
On one side, you know, uh, you might argue that, you know, the problem here is that uh, countries in uh, the south of Europe, you're um, oversimplifying things a bit, but not too much, are trying to unload on other countries the delay in their reforms, which made them more fragile and also less equipped to deal with, among other things, the current crisis. But there's also another moral hazard here. Well, as much as uh, countries in the north of Europe are, de are delaying the fiscal coordination and a settlement of fiscal coordination, they're unloading on the ECB uh, the ultimate uh, game, because this lump of debt will be dealt with in one way or another. And, you know, if the national solution will not be there, if uh, a coordinated European policy solution is uh, uh, slow to, to be seen, well, you know, then at the end, there is only one institution that will have to deal one way or the other with it, only one institution in Europe, and that is the European Central Bank. On this happy note, I would like to leave the floor to Eric so that we can hear from him and then, of course, open the floor for uh, Q&A if there is any. Thank you. Eric, it's yours. Super. Thanks a lot, Filippo. I'm going to cover some of the same ground that Filippo's covered, because when you're talking about funding uh, this monster crisis, it's hard not to say a number of similar things. But I'm going to try to put a little bit of a different slant on it in order to help contextualize the controversy that we have right now with an eye looking over to the United States and seeing what they're doing and therefore what, what, what might be possible. Uh, in, in a European context. Let me share the screen and then you can see the slides and you won't have to, to listen to me rattle on so quickly. Let's bring the toys up here. All right, <clears throat> so this is the, the closest thing I could get to a, a coronavirus cover slide. Uh, and, and the idea that, that I want to send out is a, really a threefold idea. Um, the first is that in, in many respects, and like it or not, these central banks are still the main game in town. So we're going to have to figure out uh, what that means. Um, unfortunately, they may be the main game in town, but they can't be the only game in town. Uh, and, and that's why we have to revisit the conversation that Filippo just offered uh, about fiscal policy and the possibility, at least, of fiscal solidarity. And part of the reason that we need to revisit that is because of what it means for the banking system. And this is the part that Filippo got to a little bit at the end of his talk, but I think we need to stretch out a bit more just how important the banking system is going to be, uh, not just now, uh, but and crucially in the long run as we try to recover from this crisis. So what do I mean by, by the, the only game in town? Uh, the joke in the last crisis, and it wasn't really a very funny joke, was that only central banks have the capacity to respond quickly enough and, and with enough firepower in order to have a macroeconomic effect on the crisis that we experience. Now, in a financial crisis, um, that actually works. Uh, but, but in this kind of a crisis, it doesn't. In this kind of a crisis, we have to have fiscal policy uh, in, in play. We also have to have banking supervision. We've got to have some way to get the banking sector uh, to play a positive role. Banking supervision in the European context is a little bit quicker now because we've centralized banking supervision uh, with the creation of the banking union and the single supervisory mechanism. Uh, nevertheless, these things take time to organize. And in that time period, uh, that's when the central banks become uh, the most crucial actor. Uh, over the longer period, uh, though, I think we have to remember, and this is the point that Filippo was making when he talked about the rising spreads, uh, that European financial market integration remains fragile. In other words, the same engine that brought us the last crisis could swing into operation again. And that's despite all the progress that was made in creating the banking union I just mentioned, a single supervisory mechanism, a common deposit insurance program that never really came into existence, common resolution authorities, and all the rest. Uh, now, in that context, while I mentioned central banks can buy time, as they buy time, they also distort themselves as institutions. And, and crucially, since the European Central Bank is the most important institution holding together the euro as a common currency, looking at it go through these distortions has to be worrying for the future uh, of European monetary integration. 
So, okay, uh, what do we need to do? <clears throat> this is the hang together or hang separately problem. Uh, in the European context, what we need to do if we're gonna accept what Filippo is saying, uh, we need to figure out some way to make sure that countries are able to borrow the money they need at a cost they can afford, which means probably over a very long period of time and, and trying to figure out how to get countries to be able to borrow such huge amounts of money. And I would say cumulatively, they're probably gonna need to borrow about 2 trillion euros across the course of this crisis, uh, such huge amounts of money. Uh, we're gonna have to get them to be able to borrow it at very low rates of interest and probably very, very long maturities uh, north of 10 and probably closer to 30 years in length. Unfortunately, that's not possible in the Europe the way it is configured at the moment because some countries are gonna pay more, uh, some countries are gonna be able to borrow less, and some countries are not gonna be able to be offered the same length of maturity as others. The stronger countries are gonna be able to borrow as much as they need at a cost they can afford uh, and at a maturity that fits their own debt management problems, uh, but, the, but the weaker countries are not. And, and this is a problem because the stronger countries cannot let the weaker countries fall. This is that problem of an integrated economy that Filippo, uh, Filippo alerted, alluded to, but the stronger countries also cannot let themselves fall either. Uh, and, and the failure that we have to worry about in the, in the stronger countries is as much political as economic. If you look at them, uh, uh, countries like Germany and the Netherlands, and try to understand why it is they have such difficulty making concessions in the common interest, um, you have to just look more closely at the domestic political landscape and you begin to see that the governments are, are not as strong as they appear to be. In, in fact, in domestic political terms, their weakness is often more important. So <clears throat> how should these governments hang together? What should they do? Uh, I think the first thing that we have to accept is that gifts alone are not gonna be enough to solve the problem and, and conditional lending is unlikely to be sustainable. Uh, gifts are not gonna solve the problem because nobody is gonna give 2 trillion euros <clears throat> or even a significant fraction of that. I remember when the Dutch government was mooting the idea of a benevolent fund that was gonna help the countries of Southern Europe and the Dutch government offered to give 1 billion euros, I had the feeling I was watching Austin Powers because 1 billion euros is not even gonna make a scratch on the problem that we have to face. In, in that context, conditional lending is unlikely to be sustainable either, right? Remember, the whole thing that we have to face is the prospect that the payback period is gonna be not one, three, or even five years, uh, but, but significantly longer than that. So if you put conditional lending on a country, you're basically saying it's gonna be under foreign tutelage for five, 15 to 20 years. And there's no way you can put any government under that kind of tutelage for that long. And, and as a consequence of which I think much, much sooner you're gonna see governments rebel against uh, the conditional lending. So even if you manage to convince them to make the concession, uh, that conviction, that, that concession uh, is not gonna be sustainable for those countries uh, over the longer term. Having said that the alternative of mutualizing the borrowing, getting the countries to borrow the money together is gonna to be a hard sell. I obviously misspelled hard there, but, uh, but the hard sell is because the people in the Netherlands and the people in Germany are, are by now conditioned to believe that any form of debt mutualization is an explicit transfer from their national treasuries to the countries in the South that will be used for irresponsible behavior. Um, now, what we have to do is to figure out how to soften that impression and reframe the debate in such a way that, that we can get some concession on their side and, and some concession on the weaker country's side uh, as well. Having said that, it's not immediately obvious what that concession would look like. It's not immediately obvious either that the weaker countries could club together to create their own mutualized borrowing instruments. So there's talk at the moment about the possibility that France and Spain and Italy and other countries that are interested in having some kind of a corona bond could create one by themselves without uh, without Germany and the Netherlands in the middle. But in order for them to do so, at least under the, the treaties that we that we have right now in the European Union, they would have to get the assent of the Germans and the Dutch. Uh, and, and those bonds would also need to be purchased by the European Central Bank. So uh, even, even if only through the back door, the mutualization would be obvious and it would be equally uh, a hard sell. 
Having said that, I want to emphasize the scale of the issue here, right? I mean, think about what's going on in the United States. There they have the CARES Act, which is the, the most recent stabilization act uh, that was signed by the Trump administration and agreed by Congress. This is something that mobilizes more than two trillion dollars, which includes uh, grants for income support, unemployment, and health, which are typically policies that are implemented at the state level. So for anybody who wants to argue that the federal government in the United States does not bail out state governments, they haven't been paying attention. In the context of this crisis, the key element is to lift expenditures that states otherwise would carry and to put them uh, onto the federal treasury. Uh, within the CARES Act, there's another act called the Coronavirus Economic Stabilization Act that earmarks more than $450 billion in aid, direct aid to businesses, states, and municipalities. In other words, if it's, it's not just that they're lifting uh, off expenditure items that these state and local governments would have to make, uh, but, but they're also going to give income to state and local governments in order to keep them in business. And, and crucially, uh, Congress has already looked at this $2 trillion uh, stabilization fund and, and decided that they need to begin planning another package immediately to begin preparing for the recovery of the economy that's going to take place afterwards. The best estimates that I've received from colleagues in Washington who follow this closely is, is that the total stimulus the United States is likely to offer it is going to be north of four trillion dollars, probably closer to 4.5 trillion dollars. Now, in that context, the European response is significantly underpowered, right? If you look at the direct spending that European governments are able to put together, even if you include the direct spending of the Germans and the Dutch, French, and the Italians and the Spanish and all that, like, you still don't get uh, to more than about 500 billion euros in direct spending. And then they have credit guarantees on top of that, which look very impressive. Uh, but, but remember, these are credit guarantees uh, are, are good, but they're uneven across the European economy and they still leave the private sector in debt. You've guaranteed their debt, uh, but they're gonna have to pay that debt back at some point. And it's not immediately obvious how they're supposed to do that during a transition in which they make no money. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, the common programs that have been offered by the European Commission, like the SURE program, which is intended to supplement national unemployment insurance, are very small. We're talking about $100 billion, I know it sound, or euros. I know it sounds strange to say that's a small size, but when you compare it to the size package that we have available in the United States, uh, you can see that a continental economy, uh, which is of the scale that Europe has, uh, needs significant stimulus if it's going to survive this crisis crisis. Why? Well, it needs that significant stimulus uh, because <clears throat> they have to not only uh, replace activity that's not taking place right now, but they're going to have to rebuild afterwards. And what that means in the short run is that what they've got to do is they've not only got to give people income, despite the fact that they're not actually at work, uh, but they've also got to replace significantly private debt with public borrowing because small and medium sized enterprises that are still facing rents and other permanent obligations are gonna have to figure out some way uh, to cover that. And the easiest way to cover that is gonna be with public borrowing. Now we've seen a relaxation of the rules for state aid at the European level. We're likely to see that take place further, but we'll need resources if we're gonna replace private debt with public borrowing, uh, even in the short term. In the medium term, when we finally get out of this lockdown, we're gonna to have to start mobilizing uh, the private sector. And mobilizing means basically getting people back into stores, uh, getting them to begin to move inventory again. Uh, but in the longer term, what we're gonna to have to accept is that many of those firms will not be restarted. Uh, that indeed, and very problematically, um, those firms uh, are, are going to be bankrupt. So we're going to have to recreate the jobs that are lost. Uh, we're going to have to replace the capital that gets destroyed. And we're going to have to rebuild the productive networks uh, that made Europe uh, such a successful economy uh, before the crisis uh, took place. Now, obviously, uh, banks are going to play a crucial role. And by banks here, I mean private banks. Uh, what you'll see if you look at what the European Central Bank is doing, the European Central Bank is not only very active in purchasing assets, and it's only purchasing assets like government bonds in order to give money to banks so that banks have more money to lend, uh, but it's also subsidizing banks 
to lend money to the non-financial sector. And it's penalizing them if they don't do that. Now, that's important because the banks are acting as a buffer, uh, making sure that there's enough liquidity for these small and medium-sized enterprises uh, to survive as many of them uh, as can uh, through this crisis. Um, but, but without <clears throat> a significant fiscal cushion on top of that, as I mentioned, those small and medium-sized enterprises are, are, are likely not to survive um, because they're going to still carry that debt with them. And at some point, that debt's going to have to be repaid. If those firms do not have their debt replaced by public debt, if they do not survive, um, then the banks that have lent them that money in the first place are going to see their non-performing loans accumulate, and, and that's going to weaken the banks and make it harder for them to lend money for new economic activity after the crisis, right? So right when we need those banks the most to finance the rebuilding and the restart of the private sector will be when those banks are the weakest. That's why the fiscal cushion is so critical uh, because the banks are gonna play that critical role later and they won't be able to do that if their asset portfolios are already destroyed. Now there's a right way for us to do this and there's a wrong way for us to do this. The right way is to, front load this fiscal activity. And that's to run up the debts now so that the private sector will be able to pay back those debts later uh, through positive growth. The wrong way is to wait and to prevaricate and to have the private sector collapse uh, in, in the meantime, um, because if they do, they're gonna take the banking sector down with it. Now, obviously governments are, gonna, are not gonna allow that. So governments are gonna have to prop up the banking sector at the end of that wrong way story. Uh, and the conclusion is governments end up borrowing hideous amounts of money either way. Uh, but if they borrow later rather than borrowing sooner, they're going to borrow much more money. They're going to pay much higher rates of interest. Uh, and, and they're going to have a much lower prospect of paying off the debt in the worst case scenario. Uh, and, and so what we have to agree on is that despite the fact politics takes a long time, there needs to be a political decision in Europe to provide the fiscal stimulus, uh, or this problem is going to get worse, uh, far worse, before it gets better. Thanks a lot for your attention. All right, thank you, Eric. You know, you've been far more disciplined than I have, uh, than I had a bit uh, regarding uh, the timing. So, double thank for that. As you were talking, it seems that we started. Um, uh, I can't possibly a question popped up, and that has to do with uh, okay. You know, we're not uh, um, depicting a happy scenario ahead of us. You know, this. Uh, so people are concerned. People are concerned that this is going to unravel into another sovereign debt crisis. Okay, so we get the, the question here. I'm going to read it to you, and let them. You, we can we can take a turn at actually trying to address it. Is how likely is a eurozone debt crisis after, uh, of course, at the end of this, uh, starting from uh, southern European countries that uh, the person asked uh, are at the brink of bankruptcy within the next two years. Okay, so we're asked about uh, to make prediction uh, for the next two years. Um, how do you feel about prediction? So, <clears throat> I mean. I think I think the real issue about a sovereign debt crisis that that I, you know we should all sort of think about is that in terms of a repayment crisis, uh, Europe is not going to experience a repayment crisis where everybody uh, sort of looks at a country like Italy and says, you know, uh, Italy can't repay. What we will experience is a rollover crisis, uh, a rollover crisis, a very different beast. Uh, that's where the Italian government or any government actually puts up a significant amount of debt that it needs to refinance. Uh, and so it'll issue new bonds so that it can replace old bonds. Uh, and, and nobody wants to have a rollover strike where they try to issue new bonds. Those don't get taken up, so they don't have the money to replace the old bonds. And, and, and that's something that happens very, very quickly. Do I think that's gonna happen this month? No. Do I think that's gonna happen this year? No. Do I think at some point in the future though, if Italy is paying obviously unsustainable debts, that international investors will move all their money to Germany. Well, that's what we saw just happen in March. Uh, and, and, and what the Italian government already recognizes as being a threat. Uh, and, and so we need to prevent that from happening by uh, doing anything we can. It's not an inevitability, I would argue, uh, but it is a threat. And the, and the best way to address that threat is to make sure that there's no motivation for investors to move away from Italian debt uh, 
and, and into German debt in large, large volumes. Uh, and, and the easiest way to do that is to wrap a credit wrapper around Italian debt that says, don't worry, Italian debt is as safe as German debt. So don't take your money away, let the Italians pay it back. And if I can add, if, if I can add a, just a, um, a few words on, on that, um, look, I don't know. Uh, let's say let's let's not to try to make a forecast here, right? Let's see. Let's assume, but let's think about by scenario, right? We don't know. I mean, there are so many unknown uh, variables here that it's hard uh, really to think about whether that will happen or not. But let's assume it does. Okay. Let's assume it does uh, at the current, uh, uh, given the current structure of uh, European governance. You know, the question that we should be asking is. Uh, which institution, if any, or what kind of uh, um, institution will be in place to provide some sort of a policy response to prevent the unraveling? You know, look, it's, it's the problem with uh, one of these countries uh, having suffering a rollover crisis, it, it, besides the speech, is that we are so totally integrated. You know, if you go back to one of the uh, one of the slides that I that, that I showed, you know, that showed uh, the exposure of other European countries to it, to Italy, you see really that these things. Trickle down. I mean, any unraveling of debt refinancing uh, trickle down in the rest of the eurozone very quickly. So you might not find it uh, right. You might not find it fair. But our response will need to be uh, produced. And if nobody, if we don't have a, a clear structure for fiscal coordination, if we keep on bouncing back from Eurogroup and European Council decision with no decision uh, meetings, with no decision taken in place, well, you know, at that point, we should be asking, we should be asking ourselves, what is the only likely response to take place? And uh, the answer to that question is kind of rhetorical at this point. Uh, we've already seen it uh, uh, during the Great Recession. And, you know, we, there are not many reasons to think that we should expect anything different. You know, we've, uh, the balance sheet of uh, central banks have, have grown tremendously, but, you know, they, that doesn't mean that they cannot grow more. And if there is no other option on the table, you know, well, what else, what else can we do? There is uh, here uh, another hey, question. Bro, you know, people, I, I want to ask you a question, man, because this is, I, you know, you've been in politics before and you've been doing all this economic advising. And, and, and we've got a great question from Alessandro, uh, Alessandro Lavia, which is, which is, you know, why is it taking them so much time? I mean, is it possible for politicians to act more quickly than they're going? Or is politics always just a time consuming endeavor? Well, it is, it is possible. The alternative is possible, but I think, you know, uh, I think the domestic political economy is uh, constrained or are very strong all the time, and they're particularly strong in a time of crisis, you know. So um, what, the, what I was hinting at, and actually something that you, you also picked up in your presentation, Eric, is the fact that uh, it's actually a double-sided moral ladder, the one we are facing, right? On one side, you know, it is obvious that we are cruising toward a land where very will be too much of that, and business will be, will be a bit and so, uh, a bit it's unlikely to be sustainable. Therefore, you can you have two options. You can tell your people the truth and say, look, I'm sorry, this is unprecedented. We're accumulating so much debt that we have to deal with it one way or the other. Or you can tell them uh, the half of the truth, which is this, the situation is unprecedented and uh, uh, everyone uh, will have to take care of it at some point, okay? Which is the truth, but it's only 50% of the truth. The problem is that if you tell 50% of the truth now, you have to tell 50% of the truth later. And the other 50% is that uh, when uh, you, know, you have to pay the bill, somebody has to foot the bill. And we might decide that uh, we rather have uh, uh, the monetary authority footing the bill rather than, uh, rather than fiscal, because this is just uh, more um, politically viable. But we have to understand that uh, we are giving up what is optimal from a policy point of view, which is you know, a consolidated and coordinated fiscal response, because we are deciding to give pre uh, prevalence or preeminence, if you want, to uh, the political economy of every country. You know, Italy has a very strong political economy of dubious uh, uh, advantage, but uh, so do other countries. So, so can I ask you another I one of your you. questions on the back of that? <laughs> because Please, we're... of course. Because, you know, we've got this question from Rafael Aste that seems to seems to dovetail precisely, which is, OK, so they, they take a long time um, and they're trying to resolve these domestic problems. But what impact is this going to have on public opinion regarding European integration? And, and to what extent is this whole process just going to fuel 
populism under any circumstances. I mean, can we imagine a scenario where we come out of this and go, yay, European Union, boo, populists, or, or are we just doomed uh, to, a, to a Euroskeptical populist future? I think I, I, I think I think you know the, the the answer is in the question. So of course there is a delay in decision. I mean uh, right now we are still all waiting for the uh, press conference. So I don't know whether that already happened uh, for the press conference by the European Council. So maybe uh, something will something interesting will come out of that. A uh, new deal will come out of that. But you know in the absence of it, let's say that we get into this uh, r rollover of. Uh, of uh, of uh, the policy discussion and with no actual decision and we keep on going that way over and over again you know this wave of uh, euro skepticism in the aftermath of a crisis that leaves a lot a lot of debt will put an even greater pressure on what on the available and uh, uh, um, european institution and once again if anything that will pr produce an even stronger force for the ecb to overextend its role and do more because at that point the ecb will not uh, just try to uh, preserve the world functioning uh, uh, the world functioning transmission channel of monetary policy but will have really to step in to save the euro but this is you and, i mean i think we all understand that this is really the suboptimal outcome i mean uh, unloading all this responsibility on uh, an institution that you know I think you are more equipped to point that out than me, uh, than myself, Eric, to an institution that is not uh, democratically elected, but is supposed to be independent. It's really, it's bad uh, policymaking. So if anything, this delay is actually uh, it's pushing the ECB out of its comfort zone even more. So in the interest of, I, I think, you know, countries that are very resistant to fiscal coordination now should uh, consider the obvious trade-off, you know, these are also the same countries that are very, very attentive at keeping the monetary authority independent and oriented to price stability. But if you leave that the same monetary authority to deal with a fiscal problem of this entity by itself, well, you know, some, some, something's going to give. There was, a, I think, there was, I, I saw a question for you, Eric, here. Huh? Uh, we also have some uh, questions in the Q&A box. We, we should coordinate next time to make sure they all put them in the same place. Because they're good questions. Yeah, all yeah. these questions We're, are really good. So. I am from the intercession, OK. Carlotta Minerali, you picked it up on her. Uh, Ah, there you go. That's for you, Eric, by, by Lorenzo. Uh, you, you, you will, Lorenzo would like to know, and I think this is actually in the general interest, uh, elaborate a bit more on the internal political weaknesses, or if you want, the, the domestic political economy of the Netherlands and Germany. It seems that the two countries uh, really have a pivotal role in pushing or delaying fiscal coordination at this point. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to fold this in, though, with... Uh with Tycho's question about, about the relative importance of fiscal stimulus where you got a big public sector to GDP ratio. Uh, and, and the reason the two things are connected is, look, um, if, you, if you live in Germany, Germany always talks as though it never has uh, fiscal active sort of Keynesian fiscal policy, but Germany has this giant welfare state. And so when, when bad things happen, people become unemployed, which means unemployment benefits go up, right? Um, and, and taxes go down. And so you get these automatic stabilizers in Germany. Uh, and, and the automatic stabilizers have kicked in in Germany. They've kicked in in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and because they're relatively generous welfare states, that helps them out in an automatic way. They don't have to have a big political debate about it. On top of that, they've, they've announced their own domestic stimulus packages. And Germany has gone through two rounds of domestic stimulus. And some of the stimulus that they've offered is actually very, very generous. Uh, for domestic German participation, right? So when you add uh, the, the automatic stabilizers and the domestic stimulus together, uh, the, the German situation is not too bad, right? It's not too bad. Um, having said that, um, the, the fact of the matter is that was a huge political fight already in Germany because they had to get over what they called the Schwarze Null, this idea that they would balance the budget come hell or high water, well, hell and high water both came at the same time. And, and, and so they decided, OK, this time we're not going to balance the budget. Um, but they, they now look at that and say, OK, but we can afford not to balance the budget because we didn't balance it before. And, and, and as they say that, the voices that you should be listening to 
most attentively are, are the voices in the CSU in Bavaria, in, in the right wing of the CDU, which is not all that right wing, but, but certainly fiscally very hawkish. Uh, and then outside the government in the AFD, which is the largest opposition party not participating in, in, in the coalition. And, and, and what you hear from all three sets of those voices is a real concern expressed about the risk that the government is taking on through these measures and understanding that, that at least in the CSU and the CDU, that, that these measures are necessary, uh, but a desire to return to normal as quickly as possible. The idea that they would add on to that risk, uh, some sharing of risk across countries, that makes it hard to maintain the stability of the governing coalition. Add on to that the widespread belief in Germany that debt mutualization is not about sharing risk, but actually about sharing revenue, about paying Italian debts. Uh, and, and it would be very, very difficult uh, to sell that. And, and, and what's interesting is that even in the SPD, which seems to be more open uh, to some risk sharing, uh, you see Olaf Scholz as finance minister has taken a very hard line. Uh, and, and, and as you look out at the Green Party, which is taking a more pro-European view, um, if you scratch beneath the surface, uh, what you find is that they have a fairly conventional, uh, a fairly conventional German take on fiscal policy as well. So they're a little bit more generous, but they're nothing like um, the, the kind of risk sharing uh, that we should believe uh, will be necessary in order to get the spreads aligned appropriately for Italy to borrow and pay back the money it needs. Uh, and, and if we told the story in the Netherlands, the, the story would be more complicated because the political system is more fragmented. Uh, and, and what you should know is that first, the Dutch parliament is fairly united in believing that, that there shouldn't be a huge amount of redistribution across countries. And second, the coalition government has a one seat majority uh, and, and it faces two relatively strong voices in the opposition that are arguing very strongly against uh, risk sharing so that uh, that creates a problem as well. So summarize, um, because they've got a big big public sector, they, they have automatic stabilizers, they've had the big debate domestically, they, they don't have the strength to have this big debate that includes an international component as well. And that's what their prime ministers are saying. Thanks, you know, there's, a, there's also some, some, some other question by John Hu uh, about uh, well, the US, you know, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, the EU and um, how we can rely or not rely on its, uh, 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 on its institution, uh, but the, can the EU expect anything, any uh, effect from uh, what is being enacted in the US, in particular the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act? So is there something that, is there the, a domestic response or do we, should we expect anything, any uh, effect on uh, the Eurozone, the EU at large? So, I mean, from the from the stimulus package, the good news is that the stimulus package, to the extent to which it keeps the U.S. economy alive, uh, that that represents a market that Europeans will eventually, once the planes and ships and all the other stuff you know travel more normally, be able to sell into. The better news is that that while the U.S. was doing the fiscal piece. Um, the, the Federal Reserve System in the United States opened up the swap lines and has been providing uh, significant amounts of dollar-denominated liquidity, uh, which means basically just money, uh, to, to European central banks that they can then pass on uh, to all those European exporters that actually have dollar-denominated liabilities. You know, they, they borrowed money in dollars uh, and they weren't getting any dollars in revenue because they weren't selling anything in the United States, right? So, so these guys are staying alive because the Fed is making sure that the dollars are there for these businesses to meet their payment obligations, which are also in dollars. And in that sense, the transatlantic economy is tightly, tightly connected. Um, FIPA, I want to I'm, I want to get to this thing that <clears throat> that I've got from Carlotta Minarelli, uh, which is, <clears throat> um, is it possible that this could be the crisis finally, finally, finally that convinces southern countries to undertake necessary reforms? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm laughing because it just sounds so horrible that you really have to do this. To, but but is this something that's going to going to get them to to do the necessary things? Uh, or, or is this crisis the best we can hope from this crisis that we get back to the status quo ante? Look, uh, you can be ambitious, right? You know, since uh, we are obviously trying to move ahead and very strongly so in the, in the dimension of fiscal coordination, I think it's fair and square 
that uh, you, as you push ahead of fiscal coordination, you also ask some more of uh, actual policy conversions within the eurozone. So this would be this would be a good time to do so. But you have to be very very careful now. And here I don't want to. It, uh, this is not just a, uh, a rhetorical argument. It's actually an argument regarding uh, this, what, what structural reform really really means. You don't want to uh, show that any support that European institutions provide to a country in need comes as a, um, uh, in Italian we say, in, 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 in English, uh, for, um, for, for a reform. So you don't want to give the sense of that in a sense you're going to somebody who's very much in need and leveraging uh, uh, the, the weakness of a specific country to extract a reform, okay? Because that provides a very bad signal. It's a very bad signal about political legit legitimacy, and it's something that uh, um, actually reverse it provides a very strong force toward the reversal of the reform that EU implemented during the crisis. You know, Italy has experienced a little bit of that already with the Monti government experience. You know, think about the uh, pension reform. The pension reform is actually a right. Is, is as appropriate given the demographic structure of Italy, given the uh, generational uh, imbalance. That was a policy reform that was right on the spot, okay, in the interest of the country. But it wasn't perceived in that way. Uh, it was perceived as something that, you know, as a, as a toll to pay in order to get the, the necessary support from Europe, in order to facilitate the, what then became the whatever it takes and then the uh, QE and whatever else, okay? This, is, this was extremely, extremely, uh, this backfired uh, for the uh, strength of that reform. In fact, you know, every Italian knows that the pension reform is something that comes continuously into question. And as far, as soon as the country feels off the edge of the cliff, you start to rediscussing it altogether. So you have to be very careful. It's, Totally fine that you say, look, let's move ahead with fiscal coordination, but we also have to do more policy coordination, more actually reform coordination. But you have to be careful about the timing of that. You have to you have to uh, get a commitment from countries, and that is what what gives makes the problem very complicated from actual point of implementation. But you have to make sure that reforms will take place when they will be more likely to succeed, when they will be less painful to introduce. This is a time when the country is in uh, shutdown. Many countries are in shutdown. So you don't want to add another complication to it because you, you know, this is a supply shock, what we're witnessing. But we want to make sure that the supply shock is not connected, is, does not foster or actually amplify uh, a demand shock. So this could be an opportunity, bottom line, to actually fast forward and improve uh, uh, structural reform in, in Italy and in other countries, but you have to be careful, okay? There is a lot of political mastering and, and maneuver which is necessary there to build legitimacy behind, behind that. Otherwise, you know, this, you don't want to give the impression that it's just a blackmail because that's not what it is, right? You know, you're trying in a sense to uh, add a fiscal coordination so that you create an extra incentive, not a, a, a lesser incentive, but a stronger incentive for countries to do the right thing, to do the structural reform and to actually kill the delay in the implementation of structural reform. So it, it's, uh, let's say that uh, it's a good time to think uh, about structural reform. It's possibly a poor time to introduce uh, the structural reform. It doesn't mean that in one year from now, we cannot, if we do fiscal coordination properly, we will not be better placed to actually uh, introduce uh, structural reform. So I've got a I, I've got a question that I want to hit you with from Marcus Thompson, and 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 I'm going to roll it in with a question that Kurt calls you have, uh, and they're both in the question and answer box. Uh, and and Marcus's question is, you know, why why can't we use this as an opportunity for even more dramatic reform, right? Um, and 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 in that sense, uh, you know, get rid of this normal financial system and go to something different, right? And the reason I want to bring Kurt's question in is Kurt's asking, you know, well, wait a minute, are we finally going to get out of this low inflation equilibrium, right? So if we if we have a radical transformation of the financial system, um, then 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 maybe we get a, a you know back to normal rates of inflation as well, right? What do you, what do you think? Can we do something radical out of this and end up in a better place? Well, you know, uh, we can, but you know. We, we can, but under this, the same uh, the same constraint that we discussed before, okay, it's, we have to understand that any structural change uh, 
uh, needs to be uh, built on consensus. Okay, if you what makes us a, a change structural is two things: that it touches deeply the the way we operate, the incentives in our economic society, but it, but also its persistence. So you you don't want just to make a very deep change that is short lived because then it's not a change, right? It's not a structural reform. It doesn't change anything structurally. So in, in order to preserve any change of introduce over time, you need to make very sure that you work on that political legitimacy that we talked about. So, you know, the way you frame it, you know, the, the fact that it doesn't need to be, it, it, it needs to be uh, explained for what it is, something that you do because it's right. It's not that it's something that you do because you're forced to do in order to get something else in return. Okay, it's not a trade. It's it's a it's not a zero sum day game. It's actually a positive sum game. Okay, so that that's the important bit. Now, one of the issues here is uh, okay. Look, let's let's assume we we do all the the proper thing. Okay, and we do this com, uh, combined support with monetary and fiscal policy. But you know, on the monetary policy front, we push as much as we need to do. Can we get out of low inflation because of that? Well, you know, that is a possibility, also or a risk, depending on where you stand. In, in, in your preference again for uh, price stability. But you know, uh, we've seen a lot of places around the world that have accumulated a large amount, not a lot, but you know, a few places around the world, but they've accumulated a lot of public debt and uh, they haven't pushed uh, inflation away from uh, uh, low levels. So more than inflation, your concern should, because the general concern should be uh, something else. That is, uh, you know, you produce this uh, massive uh, amount of that. You cannot get over it. Okay, you, can, you do not, you not, don't find a way to actually uh, resolve it. You, maybe you you monetize, so you bring a lot of that, that into the uh, balance sheet of the of the central bank, and what you end up with is expanded balance sheet of the central bank, a lot, large amount of that, and that. Stagnating uh, economy, right? We've seen that, you know, that that that's pretty much the story, uh, the story of Japan, and that's why, you know, we should not forget that, you know, there is an issue regarding response for, to the crisis, you know. So we want to save what's necessary, we want to address liquidity needs, do all the all the all the emergency response that's necessary, but we should not lose lose our uh, our, our eye or our perspective on the need of actually introducing uh, a structural change, which brings us back uh, to uh, the, the previous question, the one raised by Carlotta Minarelli. Now, the, the issue there, once again, is this is, this is an excellent time to introduce a structural reform. But it's an excellent time in so far we explain the structural reform for what they are. A positive change that makes us work better and it makes us more equipped to deal with whatever crisis we can ahead or whatever opportunity we'll, fight, we'll face in the future. Uh, not because you know we have to do something in order to get the money by some somebody else. That kind of logic, that kind of uh, perspective, that kind of frame is completely uh, um, self-defeating. Okay, and we've we've seen that already in Italy and in other places in Europe. All right. So so. <clears throat> I, I, I asked you to ask me a question, but I'm, I'm just going to steal the question uh, in, in any case. Uh, yes, go, go, go for it. <clears throat> we've got, uh, we've got yeah, a bunch no. of questions out there about, about Corona bonds and the European stability mechanism and, and different financing means. Um, and, and let me just start at the very beginning, right? I mean, you know, do you need to have a common fiscal authority with tax and spend capabilities if you're going to have Euro bonds? No. I mean, the fact of the matter is we don't have that and we have the ESM and the ESM does exactly what a Euro bond does. It issues mutual debt certificates, right, against a common capital base uh, and, and the people who borrow it agree to pay it back and, and yet everybody underwrites the credit, right? And the markets love those things. Uh, if you look at the capital structure of the ESM, it's fairly conservative, so you can understand why the markets love it. But the but the the rating on it is triple A. So so then the question becomes, okay, um, could we use the ESM to raise the kind of money that we need uh, for for this kind of uh, adventure? Yeah, we'd have to change the ESM treaty. We'd also have to increase the size of the the capital requirements, right? So that we could make sure that it's regarded as appropriately in the market. But it's but it's entirely possible to use the ESM to do that. What you wouldn't want to do is not change the treaty and impose conditionality on countries that's going to last a long, long time because the likelihood that they're going to repudiate that conditionality at some point in the future, particularly if 
they believe it's going to get harsher and harsher as the program wears on, uh, increases, right? Um, so, so should we use the ESM rather than Corona bonds? Yeah, absolutely, because the ESM exists and Corona bonds do not. But we should only use the ESM rather than Corona bonds if we can figure out a way to make sure that the ESM programs are politically sustainable in the countries that receive assistance. Because if they're not politically sustainable in the countries that receive assistance, those countries won't ask for assistance. And if they don't ask for assistance, then we get into the bad scenario that I talked about, where there's lots of economic damage that's done that costs much, much more to fix at a later point in time. And having said that, I do want to get to uh, this point that Dante Fecata makes in, in the questions, which is, shouldn't we wait to make decisions until after the health emergency has passed? Um, the problem with waiting to make decisions until after the health emergency has passed is that while we're waiting, nothing is happening in the economy and private sector debts are accumulating uh, with no revenue to pay them off. So if we wait and wait and wait until June, uh, we think the, the curve is going to flatten out completely here in, in Italy by the end of June. By that time, there will be no small and medium-sized enterprises left in Italy, uh, and, and, and we will have had either to, to buy them out or absorb all their debt or, or do something else. And, and so we need to figure out a sustainable way to do that now so that we don't have this problem in the future. And, and, and there was another question out there about what lessons should we learn from the United States the only lesson I would learn from the U.S. response to the crisis is uh, when you go fiscal, uh, go all in, right? I'm, I, I, I'm not going to admire the, the structure of the CARES Act, um, but, but I am going to say um, they are putting the right amount of money at this problem a la at, at, at last, and the European response is underpowered by comparison. Okay, and if I can add something to that, just which uh, it's on on another bit of the question that uh, uh, Dante Fichete uh, asked us, you know, look, the delaying, uh, the making this uh, intervention, this response to the crisis ineffective and losing a big chunk of uh, the Italian SMEs or Spanish SMEs or French SMEs or whatever, you know, SMEs across, across, it's not just a problem that uh, you can contain within the border of the country, right? You know, we are... Uh, the, the, we talked a lot in our in our discussion tonight about uh, uh, financial integration, but there is also a deeper level of integration, which is economic. You know, we be, we have all this long supply chain interconnected between different uh, European countries. You know, of can't, of companies often um, made by SMEs here and there. So the trouble of uh, desertifying, you know, uh, some SMEs or some also in some cases. Uh, large companies in one country is of disarticulating a supply chain that has proven competitive in the past and transferring then its problem, now it's the, the industrial problem, on to another country, to another country that then we need to face its uh, exit strategy from lockdown, its reactivation, and looking for new supplier, right? I mean, this, is, this is an issue. It's, it's, a, it's not just an issue for, um, for, for the single country. It's an issue regarding the economic prospect and the speed of recovery, most importantly, of the Eurozone as a whole. Okay. So, I mean, this is not just a public, you know, we, uh, we obviously focus a lot on financial, financial flows and public finances. This is not, it's an, it's an important part of the issue, but it's not the, really the core. The most uh, long-lasting effect of this crisis have to do with uh, uh, if the financial system stops providing credit, you know, if we get into a credit crunch, that created a lot of persistence to the shock. And industrially, if we start disarticulating uh, our supply chain, you know, and uh, that can be to some other country out of the Eurozone advantage, but it can be prove extremely costly for uh, the Eurozone economy. I am sure that we missed a lot of questions, uh, Eric, but, you know, we've done at least, uh, we, we, we've done our best to be, oh, yes, please. I have one more question I want to ask you, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a question from Danilo Di Mauro, uh, and it's in the question and answer box. Uh, and, and, and I guess it, the question is, is, coming out of this, are we likely to see Europe retreat back to a Europe of nation states and away from, from uh, a, a European Union? Is, is, this gonna, is this crisis actually going to weaken or strengthen our European institutions. What's your read on it? 
Well, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to play the economist here, but, I, but actually, that's actually what I'm going to play. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, our ability to preserve our economic linkage in place. Okay, so we are we we are in this uh, we are in this together, and uh, uh, on one side we have our um, interaction at the institutional level, but also we have the most fundamental interaction at the economic level. So, in so far, you know, visa crisis. It's uh, have, as an effect, you know, impoverishes our uh, productive structure, but preserves its uh, uh, bare bones. So the the, the connection, uh, the, the different supply chain. You know, think about you know, uh, think of, think about uh, the region where where uh, we are. Okay, in Emilia Romagna, we are a major producer of uh, mechanical components, uh, which. Uh, are part of the supply chain of the car industry. You know, a lot of that uh, is production in Italy. A l- even larger chunk of that is uh, ca- the car industry in, uh, in in Germany. In so far, you know, the shock we can contain the shock and preserve uh, this, uh, in, this this industrial chunk, of preserving the supply chain. Then, in so far, the supply chain stay in place. The essential part of the supply chain stay in place. We will be forced to actually uh, strengthen our integration. If instead the whole thing unravels, you know, and we start, you know, breaking, breaking, um, leaving aside pieces of our productive system and breaking supply chain, then, you know, and we start making this uh, health shock into a disintegration shock with a productive proportion. Adding to that uh, the, uh, the, the public finance problem, then, you know, the pressure toward disintegration might become, uh, might become stronger and uh, eventually fatal. I I think this is unlikely. I think this is still the unlikely scenario, but it's not something that we should completely keep out of, of the picture. I did, we are, you know, if there's, in any conversation we have, you know, when we talk about countries, there are two groups of people that are there are the financial community in in in, in among member countries which which have views about financial linkages, but there also there are, there's also the industrial community in every single country. And they have a clear sense about how much they depend on one another, how much the industrial community in one member uh, country depends on another one. Very much, very much in line to what happens uh, uh, within the United States. But, you know, this is, this is really the, the question. Insofar, we need to, uh, our work in Italy, Spain, and France is linked to the uh, production that takes place in Germany and the Netherlands. This will be a very strong force to keep us together. Insofar the, instead that these uh, linkages are broken, where this integration becomes more and more likely. Now, if, if, you know, on that, I want to I want to fold in a question that that uh, Cameron Wilson asked, and where he says, you know, look, is it possible that policymakers in some countries, uh, like in Northern Europe, are afraid to agree to Corona bonds because they don't want to be perceived as uh, as working with the Southern Europeans? I think that framing. Uh, actually is, is really interesting and important uh, because, you know, when we started this question about whether common institutions are going to be weakened and, and, and we're going to have a retreat into the nation state, um, there's a certain framing there that makes that more likely. And if you frame everything as, you know, these people are going to steal from us or these people are unreliable or we can't cooperate with these people and we don't have any interest in common, then even a very strong business community cannot maintain uh, the, the kind of integration that Europe represents. And we saw that already in the United Kingdom, right? Where, where the business community was united to a large extent uh, around remaining inside the European Union and completely ineffective in, in advocating for the, the remain case in the British referendum. Um, so, so what that means in practical terms is, is that if you believe that you want to preserve European institutions, any of you who is in the audience, um, then, then it's useful to, to practice framing this debate in language that doesn't make it us versus them and doesn't, uh, doesn't <coughs> create a, a, a problem that, that makes it more natural to retreat behind national boundaries. Uh, and, and here, Christoph Kunz uh, threw something in at the last uh, Christoph Kunz threw something in at the last minute saying, you know, why are the Dutch and the Germans and the Finns and the Austrians so reluctant to engage in mutualized uh, debt instruments? Uh, the answer is because the narrative that circulates in those countries is that these instruments are transfers. They are not. They're not transfers. They're, they're just mutual guarantees. And, and, and what I find really interesting is that they're happy to put mutual guarantees uh, onto business loans for firms that you know are very likely to go bankrupt, uh, 
uh, but, but they know that that kind of a guarantee is important. Uh, and, and yet they're unwilling to put those guarantees on debt for governments that you know are still going to be there. A hundred years from now, Italy is still going to be here, right? So if you put a hundred year bond on Italy with a wrapper around it, they're going to pay that bond off because they're still going to be here, right? But whether the firms are going to be here is a different question, right? So the risk is higher with firms, but the narrative is different with countries. And that's the narrative we need to change. People, I think we're being told we need to, to wrap it up. Do you want to, do you want to close yeah. off with any brilliant concluding remarks? <laughs> I, I wish I had I had a vote, but unfortunately, you know, the, the brilliant concluding remarks, but unfortunately I don't. So I think you, uh, you actually, in your uh, last uh, answer, you provided a positive note that we could not uh, end uh, better this conversation. Uh, let me just uh, apologize uh, to uh, many of you because I'm sure we skipped uh, some of your questions, but this is just uh, the first instance in a possibly uh, sequence of talk. We have other talk coming up uh, uh, next week for and uh, you will see them on this same channel so um thanks for uh, for being so patient with us thanks for uh, being part of, of our conversation the conversation continues and you know eyes open tonight to hear tonight what if anything has been decided at uh, the at, at the end of the european meeting so more on this channel thank you everyone thanks everyone thanks people Thank you, Eric.